Hello, it's Scott Manley here with Eve or Bust Part 8, and we are finally on our way out of Kerbin orbit and on our way to Eve. Of course, as you've all observed, I do not have much thrust in this vehicle, but as I have pointed out several times, the amount of thrust is not actually that important because the having low engine mass and large amount of spacecraft really is more efficient than having lots and lots of engines. If you have tons and tons of nuclear rockets, you really start to lose the efficiency that you're gaining. So what I'm doing here is your standard low thrust escape. I'm only firing the engines when I'm at peri perigee and therefore I'm getting the maximum of the Oberth effect. And the Oberth effect, as we all know, states that the energy produced by an engine is proportional to the velocity when it is fired. That means a rocket engine gets more efficient as it is accelerating faster and faster. And that's kind of an awesome thing to realize. But how do we do this to get the maximum amount of energy? Well, you burn at perikey when you are moving fastest. Now, there are other ways to perform an escape trajectory using a very low thrust rocket. There are actually a lot of papers on it. But when, you know, academic papers talk about departure from Earth orbit using low thrust engines they're talking about engines that accelerate at something like a fraction of a millimeter per second and in that case you're you tend to just spiral outwards very slowly and then usually there's some astrodynamic um, magic that involves lagrange points and things like that to you know really get you over it there's a whole area of trajectory optimization that uses the term weak spatial boundaries and uh, Ed Bell Bruno is the guy that uh, really established that. He came up with all sorts of fancy ways to get spacecraft from the Earth to the Moon by moving them through highly chaotic regions of the orbit so that the changes to the trajectory could be amplified by these chaotic regions. Um, now, I mean, with the Apollo program, you never had to worry about the, these chaotic regions because you were pretty much accelerating to the moon and you were going so fast, you were kind of just flying over these chaotic regions rather than spending a lot of time in them. But by maximizing your time in these chaotic regions, you know, you can amplify everything and you can get to the moon a whole lot more efficiency. Of course, Kerbal Space Program doesn't have any of this. It's only got a one-body gravitational physics system, so I have to content myself with the less efficient and, to be quite honest, the only thing that I could put my head around is uh, just slowly extending the eccentricity. And you see that we are now getting up quite a little. Our Apple Apps is now up to 5,000 kilometers. So we are out to more than 10, oh there we are, 6,000, so we're up to like 10 carbon radii, and uh, we're coming around for our f one of our final passes, we're going to put this orbit out beyond the moon. However, because we're now going so far out, we run the risk of encountering the moon, and there we have a moonar encounter, so I decide at this point to try and figure out how best to use it to my advantage. You see, I, I went and optimized this here, there, and everywhere. And normally, a Moonar Gravity Assist would be a bad idea because the energy you gain from it uh, is is offset by the fact that the, you're losing out to the Oberth effect. However, I had started my burn a little early, optimistically. I started my departure, which meant that I needed to actually kick my orbit upwards a little. So what I, I set it up to do is kick myself around the back of the moon, thereby lifting my orbit up a little and allowing Eve more time to catch up and therefore get the encounter. The other thing I did, and you'll see this, is I optimized the trajectory so I pass slightly below the moon and it kicks me up and provides a small inclination change. So after this whole thing, you see that I actually have uh, an encounter with Eve, without any intervening correction burns. Of course, it is a grazing encounter. It was an encounter at 60,000 kilometers. So, of course, uh, there, there's the encounter there already set up. That's because I was very careful to adjust my trajectory and optimize it and take advantage of the small kick the moon could give. Now, uh, I need to make a correction to this to bring myself as close to Eve as possible. And so I start to make one here. And uh, it's about, well, what, 65 meters per second, I guess. I don't know. I'm just going to read off the numbers here. You can see, of course, me poking around trying to get this thing. Actually, it's over 100 meters per second. What am I doing? I'm forgetting everything from... I'm having to watch this to remember what happened. You don't want to be watching this in real time. This is... 
this was like this is like eight hours of gameplay condensed into a one one video <laughs> so yeah i'm trying to get the thing as close to eve as possible if we get um if we if we have, impact eve that would not be good but if we are too far away then we need to correct as long as we're close to eve it's going to cost us uh, at most we need to deflect our trajectory by about 700 kilometers right what we're going to do is aero break around eve and specifically we want to aero break in such a way that it puts us in an orbit where we are going in the same direction as the planet that's very very important because as we all know eve is terrible for sucking all the energy all your delta v out of your rocket so any advantage you can gain you uh, should be happy for so make sure your orbit is ultimately going to be in the same direction and so uh yeah i try to set that thing up and the burns well you can see this again four times normal speed you can see how we are slowly working through this the, the burn itself was going to take something like four minutes, but then when you recognize that the frame rate is running slower than normal, it was literally set this thing, have ASAS, hold it steady, and then go off and make a cup of tea and dinner and take the dog for a walk and eventually come back. So there we are. Now, we're coming down at quite an angle here. And so actually, I decide to make a change to this. What I'm going to do... Well, first of all... It turns out I'm going the wrong way. Eve rotates in the other direction, so I need to thrust perpendicularly to that. And then I more or less stop thrusting when I get my uh, periaps to about 75 kilometers or thereabouts. So now it's the aero braking maneuver. Now you'll notice that I'm still coming in over the top and I'm not exactly in the same plane. This is intentional. You see, if I had to put my thing, put my orbit inclination as close to the target as possible, then when I came out the other side, I would be in an inclined plane and the nodes would be close to Eve. Now, by leaving the thing at quite high inclination relative to the surface, I guarantee that at least one of the nodes will be a long way from the planet. However, also note here, I'm having to manually fold away all my um, solar panels. The reason for that is that I bound them to an action group. Unfortunately, I bound them to the same action group that fired all the engines in the the EVE escape system. Therefore, when I turned that on, all the engines would fire up, and it was very frustrating. So it was easier to uh, manually close those than it was to manually, or to, was it was to close them using the action group and then manually turn off all the engines. So yeah, the aero braking wasn't quite as aggressive as I needed, so I needed to burn a you know, small amount of it thrust to bring myself into this orbit. Again, you see what I'm pointing out here, that th that uh, the plane of rotation, the plane of, of uh, Eve's ecliptic, cuts through this orbit a long way out. If I'd done this flat, if you had flipped the thing correctly over so that it was close to zero, then I would have the nodes much closer to the planet Eve and therefore the plane change maneuver that would put me in Eve's equatorial plane would have required much more fuel so it's actually a good thing to to realize these things to actually think about how one maneuver feeds into the next so yeah there as I'm another 40 meters per second to get this thing more or less flat uh, of course it takes a really 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 long time to do this and uh, I hope you all appreciate what I'm going through here. <laughs> I also note that the Reddit challenge is to go to Eve and back with three people, and I will probably just do a quick one of those. Re really, the whole point of this is to bring the entire spacecraft with all the bells and whistles. The rover, the lander, the and the, um, the submersible airship thingy oh yeah plus we want to go and visit gilly because you know while we're there it doesn't need that much delta v so the next thing i'm trying to do is i want to take a look at the rotation period of eve and you see that it's 22 hours 21 minutes what i want to do now is put myself well what i want to do is wait until my orbit is lined up in such a way that the periaps happens over a good place that i want to land and then i want to make sure that my orbit is some fraction or multiple of this rotational period so I want to have a an orbital period of about, you know, 11 hours or thereabouts. First thing, of course, is to go out to Apogee or Apo 
Apple Eve, Apple Eve, yes, and lift up my Perry app so I'm no longer grazing through the atmosphere. We've done enough aero braking for now. We put ourselves on a 14 hour orbit, which means that I can watch the planet uh, move slowly with each uh, apogee maneuver until I find that I'm lined up with some sort of target where I know that there is going to be a mountain nearby. Now we don't need to exactly land on a mountain, we just need to make sure that our spacecraft land relatively close to each other or we'll have a really long drive or fly and flying the airship is not the fastest thing, uh, especially since you actually have to hold keys. So what I'm doing is you see here, I'm watching the planet Eve rotate, and because I'm actually aiming for an 11 hour, 11 minute orbital period, then I'm actually going to look to see when what is on the side nearest me is interesting. So for example, there's a lot of sea there, I don't want to land on that. A lot of islands there, now we're waiting for the plant for it to come round again. And it's going to take some time. Time to parry apps. One hour. And there, look. See that whole area there? That is just piles and piles of mountains. So, at this point, I think, okay, that is a good area to land because there's bound to be a mountain. I know there's actually a mountain, more or less exactly where that thing is. It should be high enough for me to lift off from. So, I'm going to put myself, I'm firing my engines now to bring my orbital period down to 11 hours and 11 minutes. And the idea is that for every two orbits I do, Eve will do one rotation. So, therefore, every second orbit I will pass over the same place at the same time. So, over six different orbits, every second orbit, I will be able to jettison one of my payloads and have it land on Eve and hopefully land relatively close to each other. That is the plan. Let us hope that it actually works. Another thing is because I'm on an eccentric orbit like this, I only need a very small amount of delta V to bring the periaps down inside the atmosphere, perform the aero braking and landing. And so first thing that's going to go down is of course the Eve escape system. This is the critical thing. If this is destroyed during the landing, the whole mission is lost. We can go to Gilly, we could try our awesome rover on Gilly, but we can't we don't dare send any manned vehicle to the surface because it will be stranded there until I can go and bring everyone back and God knows that would take a really really long time. So there we go. We're bringing it down. Now, of course, if you were of the kind of if you're the kind of person to save and reload repeatedly, you could just kind of aim randomly and until you got on a, on a mountain top, and that would be fine, I guess. But I'm trying to do this without reloading saves and everything. So I set my peri apps to 60 kilometers, figuring that that would be a good aero braking altitude. And as it turns out, that it wasn't such a bad idea. But it wasn't such a good decision after all, unfortunately. So yeah, aero brakes fine enough. We get some awesome red flames, and red flames are the are the fireworks that we live for. It's on the night side, unfortunately, so we can't really see what's going on. But you see a nice little pool of pool of Eve liquid surface stuff there. There's also a nice mountain that is coming over the horizon there so it looks like we have at least some terrain that we can be interested in however what happens is after slowing down and meeting our periaps we start to rise up again we were going a little too fast or rather we didn't go deep enough into the atmosphere and now we're gonna skip upwards a little before coming back down. Technically, it's not a skip. A skip is actually an aerodynamically assisted maneuver. This is simply um, me being too, not going deep enough into the atmosphere. So this is a big problem because it means that uh, because I've, I've not gone deep enough into the atmosphere, the variations, it, it means we spend more time braking. And the more time you spend braking, the more the differences in the aerodynamics are going to matter. Now, most objects in the game are going to have roughly the same wind resistance, but this actually has a lot of parachutes on it. So I'm not sure how close these things are going to end up. But um, hey, that's going to be half the fun, isn't it? Just driving spacecraft around planets for hours and hours and hours. Oh no, who am I kidding? I'm going to have to come up with some way to get these things around. Thankfully, they all at least have automatic stability systems, so I should be able to point them in one direction and just 
put a heavy weight on the key or something. So yeah, here we go, second re-entry maneuver now. This will be the definitive one. This will be the final moment of truth. We shall find out if it is able to get to the surface and not entirely destroy itself. We expect some of the tires to take some damage, but that is fine because we can send our rover over there. We will have Kerbals that will do it. I mean, we could have stuck a Kerbal on this, but of course the danger is that if it crashed, that Kerbal would be absolutely committed and he wouldn't even have a nice place to stay. He would have a seat to sit on. He could drive around in it, I guess, but no, there we go. Parachutes deployed. 20 kilometers up and we are now descending to the surface and I think this is a good place for us to realize that well um, this will be a good place for us to go we can see mountains in the background they may be a long drive away I'm gonna have to take a look at the maps I've compiled I picked out a few potential landing sites and when we actually get coordinates I'll figure out which ones I'm aiming for and well, it'll be a case of rendezvousing with that, fixing the tires, and then sending this off on a long drive to the the peaks nearby. Four kilometers up. Oh, we're still falling towards that uh, other target. Oh, there it goes. We know that we're about a kilometer up. Parachutes open. And so we come down to the surface. Will we survive? Well, of course we will, because we've tested this. Ha <laughs> ha, there we go. Brilliant. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.